So I've been asked uh, to uh, lead us a short uh, panel discussion with um, everyone just to kind of pull through some of these ideas. We try to find connections between these very different but very connected um, presentations. And then I'll open it up to the audience. So I'll, I'll start with a few, a couple of questions and open up. And if you have none, I'll continue, but um, we'll have a short little bit. Um, and I thought I'd start with the first question, kind of an overarching question really about Utopia, um, because this exhibition as a whole is called Utopia Factory. And um, you know, the notion of manipulating um, future, manipulating what might be utopic. Uh, and um, if we can also take the lens to urban planning, especially uh, with what you've been working on, Matt, um, I'll, I'll start with you, Nils, and just ask, how is, um, uh, and, and I'll uh, add one more thing too. Um, you have referenced one of your projects, not necessarily to the, the idea of Lewis Mumford, and the idea of Utopia being something of an ancient city or a, a looking at the ancient city as, as, a, as a model. So, how is Utopia um, revealed in the work in the research uh, identities? How, how would you identify Utopia from the work you've done? Well, I, I see. Um... I see utopia as, in its kind of um, original sense, as a, as a, um, a critical tool. So um, when Thomas More wrote Utopia, he was critiquing the society in which he lived. I don't think he was really intending to create a new society. He was just wanting to reveal certain inequalities and things that were going on that he was unhappy with in the society in which he lived. And that's how I see it working as as a, as a tool, if you like. And um, so I, I use utopia as a way to reveal um, existing conditions and to then critique them. I'm not interested in making a new society. Um, I'm interested in seeing maybe what could be changed, but not creating a utopian idealistic state or something. Right. It's not a lot of those kinds of projections. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Let's go to Marco and Kyle. Um, louder. <laughs> um, utopia, if we think about Utopia Factory from the perspective of creating a new identity for a nation and um, uh, the idea of creating this prolific building culture, 2,000 projects, or 2,000 commissions, 800 buildings, um, that's um, such a major effort. How do you fit Utopia into that? What, what's utopic about this project? Or how would we identify utopia in this centennial? Um, or is it even utopic? Yeah, I, I, it, it's, a, it's a really difficult question because it, in some ways I would say it's not utopic. Um, because it's actually, it's, it's not proposing something that isn't already incipient, right? Like it's, it's giving form to something that's already happening. And in fact, because architecture moves so slowly, What's interesting about the phenomenon of the Centennial projects, I think, is that, and, and you look at Expo as part of that, this architecture that was is supposed to be, in some ways, so futuristic, um, is actually kind of representing the end of something, more than the beginning of something. Uh, and it's almost like, once it's realized, once it takes form, it can no longer be utopian, because it is now what it is. Um, and it's important, I think, to recognize that, you know, while this work is happening, Modernism is also on the verge of kind of, I mean, to borrow a phrase, to collapse under its own contradictions. Um, and not long after the centennial, we see a complete rejection of modernity and modernism as, as a kind of legitimate language for architecture. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think it's actually representing the end of something more than the beginning of something. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there were, um, There were, you know, within within modern architecture, that you can, there, there's always a, a utopian impulse that you can read, right? There's 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 usually a, a, an explicit desire to create a better world in in much of modern architecture. Uh, whether they were successful or not is a completely separate question. But there was there was usually a desire to do it and a stated or unstated hypothesis about what that better world would be, right? And, um, and that's, that's why we start with, with Ethan Baker and with Pearson, right? Because they're doing that. 
right? They're saying that we're going to have this big project, and these are, and I'm using my words now, these are the utopian principles that we want these projects to follow. And uh, so what's interesting to me, well, many things, but, <laughs> but one of the interesting things is, is what comes out through that epilogue, uh, and the, the idea that, that that utopian impulse was maybe naive, or maybe doomed to failure, or maybe it was obsolete before it got started, right? Uh, and so, you know, it, 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 it kind of stands as a, among other things, as a kind of reminder of the danger of treating utopia not as a critical exercise, because I totally agree with you, but as something that can actually be projected and, and constructed. And then I'm reflecting upon the idea that um, there, there was almost remorse in the fact that we can't commission in the same way that we had at that time, that we never would have something with the Zanaki's performance in the National Arts Building. Yeah. So um, is there anything that, that would lead us to believe that maybe there was some utopia at that time, that we want, that there was a future of ambition in a way, or is, how do, how do we square that? How do we square that idea that there was such a progressive commissioning um, at that time? Um, look, well, I'll, I'll start this one as well. Um, the, I think, um, you know, I, I, there is, a, there is a, a, a difference between an utopian impulse and a, and a future view. Right? Um, and, and, you know, I, I would say, from what I've read about the, the moment of commissioning of, of Yanis Sanakis and so on, there, there was no, that wasn't actually thinking about a future. That was just saying, this is what we do now. Right. This is not what we would have done five years ago, but this is what we do now because this is, our, this is what the world is. Right. So I, I don't think that was actually about a utopian idea. Right. I think that was just saying, we want to be cutting edge, this is cutting edge. Mm -hmm. As can Canadians, we have to be cutting edge, especially in this giant new facility we've just got. Mm -hmm. The second question I have is really around inclusion, and uh, I'm going to start with Colin and Marco on this. Maybe you kind of ended with that idea of um, the, the types of audiences that are missing, and I, I'm, I'm struck with you know when we think about the Massey Report and how it was really saying we need to develop an identity, we need to have a culture that's um, that's represented in Canada, um, and there are n numerous you know even um, community centers that were part of this project. And yet there are some communities that at that time weren't really recognized as part of the community culture that we're now starting to identify and reconcile with. So I'm wondering, what was identity at that time and um, inclusion for who? Who was, who was out of the picture that maybe if we have a centennial now, we might be looking at differently? Well, I think it's pretty clear that in that particular period, certainly through Diefenbaker's um, comments, there was still very much this characterization of Canada as, as being the result of these two founding nations. Not only, as Carl pointed out, not only was there no mention of First Nations, but there's also no mention of the diversity of, of immigration that had built the country up, which was amply represented in the architects who were, who were working on these projects. Um, I think it's, it's all, you know, we look at the context in which these projects emerged in the 1960s, which follows the, you know, the post-war baby boom and the development of a very substantial middle class, it's pretty clear that that's who's being talked about and represented, right? Um, there's no real discussion at that point of marginal communities or, but there's, a, there's also a very different culture in terms of how we identify, right? I mean, in, in the modern period, there's much more of a kind of idea of orthodoxy and a singular audience, as opposed to, you know, with, with postmodernism and the critique of identity that comes out of that, now we have this very complex notion of identity. Um, and many sub-identities and self-identification and so forth that wasn't talked about in the same way in the 1960s. Um, I think the audiences were there, but unacknowledged. Not so much that they weren't there, but they were just unacknowledged. And I think that's represented in, in, in you simply look at the architects. So again, unacknowledged, but the fact is here, here's this mosaic of, of people from you know, various uh, um, cultural backgrounds building the project that is supposed to represent the two great foundations. Um, 
you know, it's, um, I'm not a historian in that sense, and I, I was, you know, five years old in 1967, so it's, it's hard for me to put the lens of that time on and think about, you know, who was, who was, uh, what voices were being heard and what voices were not being heard. Um, but, um, but I think it's, it's and, you know, and, and in, in the other kind of simplistic way, Ethan Baker was correct in the sense that the people who were at that initial confederation conference back in 1864 were English men and French men, or, uh, you know, English background or French background. I don't have all the names in my head, so I don't know. There may have been one person from another background, but I would doubt it, to be honest. Um, so, but I, but I think, you know, that the, the whole question of identity has quite clearly become much, we've become much more aware of it and much more um, aware of the complexities and difficulties of it. You know, and and you know, I, I didn't mention, we, we haven't found reference to a single woman architect in, in any of the Centennial projects. Right? We, but, and then I'm thinking as well, I grew up in Stratford, Ontario, right? where the, the, the first the, the festival theater that we showed was present. And I know that was not for the people who live there. You know, that was tourist land. You know, you know, maybe you got a free ticket once a year. You know. So, you know, the question of who's actually being represented by these things is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big one and an open one and one that's shifting. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm going to throw this over to you, this like, the idea of inclusion and identity. And I think the idea that you've talked about discrete histories and uh, for the anarchist library, for instance, or even um, the idea of the trash um, being used in, in, as an education uh, place. So the idea of um, who, who's, who's being identified, and, and especially I'm thinking back to if you're thinking about public space and even the active playgrounds and, and the idea of who's using these spaces. Um, how do you, how, do, how is identity related to the kind of work that you've been exploring? Well, I, I suppose it's more in the process where um, I try, not every project, but because I, I work in a, in a relatively site-specific way, and um, so each project is really determined by the conditions in which I am commissioned, and where the building is, and who runs it, and who lives nearby, and so on. And um, so I, tr I t tend to work with um, people um, in work through workshops to try and get some sense of ownership from that um, for the project and um, um, also looking at how public money in, from the, in the arts can maybe be used for other things uh, utilized by local uh, uh, people communities in order to develop something else rather than just the sculpture. So it actually has maybe more of a function to it. Um, so I don't think that, I'm not sure if that answers your questions about identities, but it really is about uh, getting people involved in a process whereby they can then access the funds as a resource in order to develop something that maybe they need more than um, just some, um, like a bit of steel. Mm -hmm. Well, and by reframing the function of public art, if you will, it's addressing different people that might not yeah. connect with the Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The next question I have for you, and this is my last question before I open it up, is really about the planetarium. Um, Nils, I'm going to start with you, um, and just the research that you've done downstairs in that room about the planetarium, and um, the media responses that were captured, and um, everything from our eyes are in the sky, uh, actually, I have it, so I'm going to need to be accurate. Uh, <laughs> um, but the idea that um, we're spending like we're drunken sailors, or this will put our head in the stars. And then on the other side of the coin, coin it was like, well, this will stand for centuries, and this is futuristic and bold. And so this positive and negative uh, fear and, and hope uh, related, um, what, what were some of the experiences that you had from the research, and what, what were some sentiments that you felt were strong to represent for the planetarium at that time? Well, the, 
the majority of the press was actually very positive um, from, my, from what I found, at least. It was really the, um, the couple of city members who were very much opposed to it. There was also confusion between it being uh, an observatory and a planetarium, mm. and people weren't really sure what the difference was, and um, so people were, were a little bit um, uh, confused by having an observatory right in the centre of the city, when of course it wasn't an observatory, it was actually a planetarium, so there's d discussions like that around it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a big competition um, to name it, which was a public, open public competition, and um, people could write in to give a, a new name for the plant, for the new building. And um, when, I can't remember the, the, the final um, one that was chosen, um, I think it was related to a hill nearby, um, it was called the Something Something Planetarium, which was related to the landscape. And um, the city d decided that that was not a good name, so they just completely ignored the competition and <laughs> named it what they wanted to name it. <laughs> so they were, I think, really, um, I mean, that's, I find a lot of pleasure in looking at particularly the press articles about various projects. I've done, a, I've done similar projects before in other locations and looking at just the, um, just, just some of the very um, strange and um, angry and humorous reactions to um, these types of buildings um, and how people really try to go out of the way to try and stop them as well. Mm -hmm. And so for Colin and Marco, uh, just had a little bit of a response on the planetarium and um, uh, really thinking about um, what the hope was for that time. And so from your research on the planetarium, and also we've talked about this before, about the size of Calgary at the time that the planetarium was commissioned. What can you respond to as far as what was happening when the planetarium was commissioned? Well, we don't, we don't know the history as intimately because, of course, it's one of many projects that we looked at. Um, but it's not unique in that sense that a lot, of, a lot of communities were punching way above what you would expect they should be able to. And so it also, I think it also speaks to a future orientation, thinking not only in terms of uh, the expression of the building and so forth, but you know, the future of our community. Our community is going to become something that can support this, whereas it might seem maybe out of place for us now. Uh, this is where we want to have, this is where we want to go. That happened very much even with the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto, which of course is a much bigger city. Um, it more than doubled in size over the scope of its design. Uh, the budget went from five million to 25 million over the course of, you know, and, and there was enthusiasm for this. Like there was a, an understanding that, well, we need to do, we need to do more because we're going to grow into it. And I, I would wager that the, the planetarium would have been a similar conversation. That yes, maybe you know this is not something that we would normally associate with, with our community now, but this is where we're heading. Yeah. This is where we want to go. And I think you were even mentioning earlier that um, a lot of buildings were being built for much more recreational art centers. So the idea of selecting a planetarium, something that in the, the comments that you were getting from the media, it was not super practical, or it was not something that felt. It was necessary. There was there were questions about do we really need this? Right? But it was it was um, it was also thought of as an art centre, the planetarium. Oh, yeah. that's it was um, the director at the time um, was really um, quite adamant about making it into an art centre. So actually, part of it is a gallery. It's meant to be a gallery. The circular area at the top um, is all made for as a gallery space. And I think also part, part of what's happening with these planetariums, of course, Vancouver did one as well, and Winnipeg did one. Um, there's this idea, too, I think, that you know, there's a space race happening, which is, of course, a competitive space race, and it's happening at the, you know, at the height of the Cold War. Um, so there's also, I think, a, a desire to engage the public in these activities that are not just happening in the NASA labs, but you know, as a culture, we embrace this, this value. But, you know, I, I, but I do think it's a question that would be interesting to pull up more information about, do a little bit more research because, you know, as as we mentioned, well, I had the numbers here a second ago. You know, there were 299 recreational areas, 520 recreational structures, 428 community centers, 67 museums and art galleries. You know, these are kind of. Um, really functional buildings within a community, right? Whereas you, you have to think that a planetarium, even, even with gallery space in it, is, is, is more of a nice to have rather than a good, 
that rather than a need to have. Right? So uh, I don't know what that says about Calgary. And if you if we compare just for a moment Calgary and Edmonton, right, where Edmonton's was a library and Calgary's is a planetarium, right? The, it seems to me that there's some kind of civic psychology going on there that's that's very different. But I, you know, not being from here, I shouldn't really talk about it. But I got a sense of what reading on this material, I got a sense that people were very proud of it. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when it first opened, there were very, very high visitor numbers, but they quickly plummeted, and um, people just stopped going to, to visit it. And uh, that's what one of the quotes on the post on the URL says, it says, Cal Calgarians are not stargazers. And that's because basically um, no one went to it. Mm -hmm. So um, they had to quickly try and reinvent it, what to go on in there, what, what to do with it. And then over time, um, it just went, it start, just started to deteriorate. And um, to a point where the people would go there and would be scared to go in because things were falling off and it was dark and they thought they'd get mocked. <laughs> so, but that happened very quickly. I'm going to open this up. Anybody have questions? Um, a, a couple of anecdotes and then a question. Uh, on, while we're on planetarium, uh, Jack Long was a mentor to us at our Dutch students here, and Jeremy Sturgis and I and a lot of others spent a lot of time with him. So we had a lot of talk about this building. Um, it was the persistent rumors that the design is authored by a Polish guy in the, in the office. It was not taken seriously at the competition stage, and he's the guy who rented out the interesting game. And if you look at the drawing style of these drawings and look at the rest of the work from the firm, they're really quite different. So I think that's a pretty big flag. Having said that, Jack and multiple I should we absolutely realized it is their building. They were the authors of building it. I have no problem with attribution, but it was there was an outline. When Jack talked about it, he talked about Fort Tower, Calgary, which used to be just east of us, near Inglewood, where his base was gone, but that was the institution that made the city. He found of his, this building being the other fort. And if you look at them, they have a bilateral relationship to the city. So you think the only thing for missing for, which he was inherently about, he missed and would advocate in rebuilding it. In its absence, you make a new, in which the both historicist and futurist for it on this side. So I think the, the readings are right. But, but I think the fortness of it, very evident in the landscape shot, intended. Also, Jack was a pretty hard leftist and really alienated from the kind of corporate towers going on downtown. And I think the reason he snatched on this direction, perhaps co authored by someone in the office, as being so different and contradistinction to downtown. So that, that, that's an anecdote. Uh, one other anecdote, uh, uh, in the first presentation, I couldn't help but react to the comment on what could public, what would a public art piece be that could stop gentrification, you know? <laughs> uh, um, obviously, the, 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 uh, other than literal things like the rendering plant or something was so stinky or nasty. But uh, we went through a version of this in Vancouver. Uh, I'll send this around because it's got a floor plan in that context, but uh, uh, this is my monograph of Jim Chang on that preview thing. Uh, Jim Chang did two parts of Copper Pacific, one called Marina Side, one called Keyside. And there's a major multi-million dollar public art commission in between. It was one by a guy called Alan McWilliams. And his proposal was a rotating uh, flat cylinder uh, upon which three massively larger than human size urns uh, would be placed. The three urns would kind of slowly rotate, rotate that had a ceramic finish, etc. Uh, the fine elegant piece, absolutely stymied. It was commissioned, paid for, whatever, well underway. Uh, well, Lee Kashing and a lot of the owners coming in said, absolutely no way. And this is an agricultural reason. Urn is the symbol of death in Chinese culture. The worst possible thing for marketing possible would be, would be having like three crosses or three coffins. <laughs> you know, so it absolutely stymied. Al uh, had to redo it as a wimpy little lotus fountain now um, in its place uh, to take out 
Uh, now the real question, I think we, we, we owe you some attention because it's been a while since we saw it. Uh, I couldn't help but take, with, I saw your bus renovated with, you know, with the growing green and, and all of that. I couldn't help, you pass on it. Uh, could help but think of um, another, uh, you know, icon of the 60s, etc., Ken Kesey, right. the Mar the Magic Pranksters, <laughs> and book the, book the, the bus called Further, yeah. which, by the way, if you read the top of the book, there's a wonderful anecdote of Further coming to Bath and parking in front of the United Church of Bath Avenue in 1964 and giving up free uh, LSD to the teenagers. Um, you know, it's a, a wonderful little footnote uh, on that. But, that bus itself, you know, which used to rot in, in, the, in the farm of Kankisi and Eugene, was, was eventually uh, retrieved by Smithsonian Restored that's in their collection now, as an icon of its time. So I guess my question to you is, you think of further the bus with its copying of Indian cotton prints and Guatemalan weaving and acid experiences and all of that, all of those icons, are there, they took up the floor, they put in wood, all of that. Uh, as you went through your work, it seemed to include every uh, trope or meme of alternate building practice of the 60s and 70s, stack wall, straw bale, you know, I can't think of one of those alternate practices that was there. But they were all, almost like a painting on the bus. They're there for their mean value or their tropes. So it's very interesting because your work seems to be based on uh, taking tropes from those practices uh, and applying them a bit like paint on the bus. Yeah. Am I right? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I suppose I've, it's also been um, described as a form of realism as well, which is maybe also alluding to what you've, you've commented on. But I see it more as a way of looking at former ideas or old ideas from the 70s, 60s, 70s, some 50s and trying to resuscitate them within contemporary conditions to see whether they, what happens. So for me it's more like an experiment to see what, how these things can be kind of brought back from the dead and because um, most of these things have been kind of written off and um, I was thinking well as conditions, cha conditions are always changing so why not revisit these ideas and actually see if they work within a different kind of context? And uh, because working in the arts, it's much easier to actually, and it's quicker than in working within the architecture to, to, to implement these projects, it's faster. So that's kind of why I've been looking more closely at these alternative methodologies and then t testing them, if you like. So it's kind of, um, in a way, they're more like, um, research experiments um, on a very small scale. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I don't necessarily see them as tropes. I see them more as um, as a kind of like a little experiment. Iconographic, does that work? No, I, I don't. I think they're operating almost entirely visually. The, the builderly qualities they have is almost incidental. Yeah. They're being focused. Yeah. Icons. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't say that because I think some of them are actually almost impossible to photograph because they, they look so um, crap. But um, it's more, I'm more interested in the process and also how, um, how do these things, how do things get, how does space get, get produced and what are the also, as I become more kind of entwined working with engineers and urban planners, I become more interested in actually how these things work. And before I was just looking at them from the outside, um, maybe discussing them um, with uh, artist friends and curators. But I realized that if you, within that group, within that milieu, you can't really change very much. And I thought if, but then I realized as you get closer to engineers and uh, planners and also politicians, you really actually can make very small incremental changes through discussions and social contact and so on. So that's for me is more interesting than it as a sort of image. Yeah. Um, but in another way, it could, it does work as an image, as a way, as, as a as a kind of um, I don't know, as a um, as a as an example, if you like. So this could actually happen somewhere else. Or, um, I'm working on a project in Milton Keynes, and in in when. They put together the, 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 the plans for Milton Keynes, 
the planners um, built this, uh, made this special pack called the infrastructure pack. And in it, there's a drawing of, the lamp, of one of their lampposts, the dimensions, everything. And the, then there's a bench, then there's um, a litter bin. Every element of the new city was in this pack. Of, with the loo everything was on a loose sheet of A4 card. So you could actually just take this box and give it to a planner in Leipzig and say, here, go, you can make a Milton Keynes. So I'm interested more in that kind of idea of a sort of maybe more educational way of looking at what could be possibly a way of making a change. As a follow-up, I'm just wondering when you were presenting the, the pushes as something that would allow biodiversity to walk, to walk through the access of the streets in, in the park. Oh, yeah. um, I started to wonder if permaculture could be utopic. Yes, it is. It's very utopic. It's very rigid as well. It's, um, if, you, if you work with permaculture gardens, maybe there's some in the audience, I'm not sure, but um, if, you do, if you don't do the rules properly, basically you, they say it doesn't work. So there is a very rigid utopian aspect to uh, permaculture. And also the early, um, early um, uh, utopias were these um, urban gardens, basically. I mean, most, most utopias are, the majority of the utopias are set in cities. And there's a very strong gardening, um, food production element to it for sustainability. And that really, you can see that that link from permaculture directly to um, early utopian novels and ideas. So yes, it is. Questions? Questions? Um, just, I thought it was in the collision of uh, uh, a particular kind of architecture with the centennial. And uh, so uh, my question is backstage. Is it way cheaper, or is it the economy? Is it way cheaper to build a, a building that looks like a prison? Than, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, prisons are among the most expensive buildings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, no, and in fact, some, some of these buildings also have very lavish um, uh, art budgets as well, like uh, integrated into the building. So the National Arts Center has these amazing cast aluminum doors by Georgi Benet, the same artist who did the, the Quebec murals. Um, an absolutely spectacular stage curtain by Michelle Bouchard and a number of other pieces by, by Canadian artists. Um, so the, the, they, these were not inexpensive buildings. Yeah. They, were not, they, they weren't cheaping out. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is um, for those of us who, you know, sort of get fetishistic about building materials, um, the quality of concrete in Canada in the 1960s and into the 70s was extraordinary. <laughs> extraordinary. And the, the, the stuff we do today is, does, is, does not even come close. So, so the level of craft and the level of care that went into the detailing of this concrete was, was quite something. It was not it was not concrete that was treated conventionally. Very often it was board formed and very carefully formed so that you know the, the, the boards for the form work were selected so that you would get the right kind of imprint and, and, and negative result in the casting. Uh, very carefully put together. And, and you know, if we take it as an example, the Confederation Center in Charlottetown, it's not concrete, first of all. Um, I mean, it's concrete structure, but, but the, the surface is a, a rather beautiful limestone, sandstone. It's a sandstone that matches the sandstone on the pro historic province house. It comes from the same quarry, but it's cut quite differently. It's cut in panels rather than in ashlar. And, and it's very beautiful. It has a lovely texture to it. It's green. Um, and <laughs> but you know, but, but as, and so you know, unlike this photograph, if you're there on a on a sunny day, it's actually really beautiful as an object. Right? Um, but but it's also highly abstract mm -hmm. as a building. Right. So, you know, I, I don't think you would say that if you were there, I don't think you would say this building looks like a prison, but you might well say, I, I don't really understand this building. Like, I don't understand how I get into it and what it's supposed to be doing and so on. Um, and then the spaces inside it are, are kind of glorious. You know? So, I, I, again, these were not, the, these buildings don't have the form they have because people didn't have budget. They have the form that they have because they were coming from 
uh, very particular ideas about architecture that were current in the world and found their own type of language within Canada at the time. But, but you know, I, I, I just want to get one, I, I haven't seen anything in which Dimitri Dimakopoulos was the architect of this building, or Fred Liebensoul, who was the architect of the National Arts Center, um, talk about their background in relation to these buildings. And this is back to the idea of identity. Yesterday, I was in, in Saskatoon, and I saw a couple of um, uh, young, youngish architects um, speak. Uh, one of them was, was uh, Alfred Wong. And, um, they both started their discussions by talking about where they grew up, right, and the, the particular formal and natural characteristics of the of the landscape of the built form where they grew up, and it was clear that for them that's what's been key to their to the architecture, you know, and layered with many things over the years since, but but still, you know, like for for Alfred Watt, who was uh, who grew up in Yellowknife, it was about the the mine hands. The, the timber structures of the mines. So, um, you know, that's a different relationship to identity than I think was more common at this time. Like I, I see these buildings really being abstract, theoretical, geometrical, yeah. and not about personal experience. Yeah, I wasn't thinking so much of these ones as a person. I was thinking about what came after. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, I said I drive by buildings that are made of concrete and they have big panels or just got stone stone. But who the hell is that? It's not that. And you're just like, uh, it's, it's the bad that the downward. Well, um, anecdotally, and, and I don't have particular individuals because this is a memory from many years ago, but. but it's often not a question of what the budget is. It's that for on public projects, politicians are often known to say, I don't care what the building costs, but it can't look expensive. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the, um, the Pantone is, if you, look, if you look at it, which I'm sure you have carefully up close, it's actually different types of shuttering. It's actually very beautifully made, um, and very well thought out in terms of the textures and the grains of wood. The one thing that I found surprising, but maybe, I don't know if this is normal, but when they, when they won the competition, um, the architects realized they didn't actually know how to make the building. So they had to sort of figure it out as they went along, which I suppose is a reflection of maybe not really having a budget. It was kind of maybe it was just sort of open call or something. But that, was, that would certainly have been more common then than now, yeah. right? And I, there was there was a spirit of experimentation, but it also it was because it was also coming out of a different climate in terms of uh, um, aversion to risk and liability and all those kinds of things, which have become really onerous. Um, but certainly there was a there was a tremendous spirit of experimentation yeah. uh, during this time. A lot of new construction techniques. Really Look at um, Habitat. It's this huge experiment. It was. It's, Insanely old budget, um, but they wanted to try. Yeah. Uh, I just have one. Yeah. Uh, the quality of concrete often uh, comes to mind. Uh, I spoke once to someone working on the Glenmore Reservoir, part of the dam itself. He said that the concrete was 200 year concrete. So, probably a technical thing, but um, it makes me wonder about our commitment to the building, and if that somehow informs how long we have it or sets the standard for when we leave a building. Thinking about what's done town, the small school or the building is on. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, but one of the things to keep in mind is that buildings are not simple and monolithic things. Some things age faster than, parts of the building age faster than others. So, so you might have a 200 year building in terms of its structure, but its mechanical systems might be out of date in 25 or 30 years. And that's not a small reinvestment. Its building envelope might need to be redone after 50 years. You know? So there's all these kinds of life cycle things that come into play. One of the things that's obvious to us about this generation of buildings is that these buildings are now very vulnerable. And some of the some of the, the, the buildings that we've talked about have undergone significant um, 
uh, restoration over the years. They all have new roofs, new mechanical systems, these kinds of things. Some have undergone some very unsympathetic renovations. Um, and you know, the Milner Library in Edmonton being one example. The, all, the, all the buildings that you see here, the way they're represented, as Colin mentioned, all the photographs we've used are from the, the time of their completion. So you're seeing them as they were intended to be. Many of them no longer bear much of a resemblance to what you see in these photos. They've been quite badly transformed. And interestingly, and this is not an uncommon thing, the architects who were the initial architects, they might still be around and in practice, but the client, nope, we're going to use someone else completely. And, and that's a huge problem in terms of understanding the, the continuity and the thinking in the building. Uh, the planetarium has been very badly chopped off. Um, so the, front, the whole front area has been just completely chopped off. And um, it's a very different building from when it, was, when it opened. And it's, it's, there's a, a, as you know, the, 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 the light rail runs right almost like next, I mean, it's nearly touching it. It's, um, it's um, a very difficult building now to, to figure out what to actually do with it because it's been so mocked about with. I wish I'd given the, that science center, the planetarium, as an example rather than the school department. <laughs> Isn't it also the challenge that a lot of these buildings in the Buddhist style are of a period of modernism that isn't necessarily not good for being preservable yet, and they're just too young, and so it's hard to, what's the, what's the ability to heritage protect, for instance, some of these buildings? Right, well, I think, I think they're just coming into that age where people are starting to look at them as historic, and so the fact that they're hitting a 50th anniversary is significant. Um, but this is something, that's, this is a, a topic that's come up in our, in our program at school where we're dealing with this more with students because of the aging modern and the kind of loss of the, the sort of generation of buildings. But we have to remember that, you know, 50 years ago, Victorian houses were being torn down to be replaced with apartment towers. And then at some point we said, hey, that's a really bad idea, let's save all the Victorian houses. Well, the Victorian houses at that time were about the same age as these modern buildings are now. So maybe there's a, a consciousness that's about to turn to say, oh, you know, once a building is in its, I don't know, fifth or sixth decade, we start looking at it a bit more as, as historic, you know, mm -hmm. rather than just tired and in need of repair. Sometimes architectural, yeah. architectural tastes, and I use that word for a reason, um, seem to kind of run in generational yeah. form. So, Maybe there's something Freudian about it, but, but you know, you always hate the buildings of your father <laughs> and adore the buildings of your grandfather. Right? And an interesting footnote to the file last year when City Council was considering an option to fund the building upgrades, a city councillor said, wouldn't it be simply just to demolish it and clean up the site? And that was just as recently as last year. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. sure. But, and you know, another, another anecdote on that. I'll give two, actually. Um, there's a, a, a magazine in Toronto, a weekly magazine that does a best of every year. And uh, around 2000, they all, one of them is best building. Right? And worst, they do best and worst. And in, in around 2000, the same building in Toronto won both. Best <laughs> and worst. Right? Um, and the, the other anecdote is similar. That I, you know, I was working in an office with, with uh, run by a couple of you know very very well known Toronto architects, and we were talking about the worst buildings in the city. And I don't know why we were doing this, but they mentioned two buildings that, for me, those were the two buildings that got me interested in being an architect. <laughs> I don't know if we're at almost the last question, but I would suggest yeah. that. Well, it's mainly give you guys credit. I mean, what a schlep this was. I mean, uh, and uh, by the way, we can do trade seats afterwards because the book hasn't made it in my lap yet, so I guess we can do trade seats. But uh, the Norris Project, I'm going to go back and read all that, that stuff and budgets and, and the prehistory, which was, was uh, quite amazing. And then uh, the range, range of materials. I guess I've got, I've got questions about that. I, it seems to me that this is a very and not just because Stephen Gray really should preface, this is a very progressive conservative exhibition. Because you pack both concepts into it that have all the work. 
uh, uh, many of which are progressive in formal or social terms, and others which, within the range of 50s and 60s moderns, are very conservative. Yeah. So that conundrum, that very Canadian idea of progressive conservatism, infiltrates the exhibition, I think. You know, and, and it, it, I don't even remember the, the contest for, you know, as American as there's apple pie, what would it be for Canada to do one? As Canadian as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, just, uh, of course, we can carry on over beer on this, but I, I, I guess I stumble on your critical rubrics, the organization phrases, because they are all progressive conservative statements. Yeah. It's brutalism and landscape, not versus landscape yeah. or or both. It's regionalism and modernism, etc. And this strikes me most countries the thesis would be the, either the creative tension or the evolution from one or the other. But in your critical rubrics here, they're all equally on the platter. So is the exhibition trying to be both progressive and conservative? Well, I would say the exhibition is, well, and probably it's because we are interested in um, trying to see the contradictions and the, the multiple readings of things. So it, it is, you know, it is brutalism and landscape because sometimes those things are in contradiction to each other, sometimes they're in opposition, and sometimes they, they, they mesh, right? It's, it's national, National identity and regional difference for the same thing. You know that, that sometimes you can you can see an attempt to, to build something national. That sometimes on some levels it works. Certainly in the in the kind of cultural infrastructure that gets built, and then in other ways you can see that it's that there's a that, that maybe that's a fool's game. Maybe it's not actually possible. So so I would say that that um, you you're right. I wouldn't have used the term progressive conservative myself, but 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 yeah, the, the, that 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 uh, concern for the for the, the multiplicity and the contradictions and, and how it's not a clear not a, not a clear clear narrative. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that there is a way in which the projects have that quality of kind of sitting on the fence in some ways. Yeah. There's a kind of radicalism about them, but there's also a, a safe kind of safeness about them. And I think it is also because the intention behind them is to create this kind of harmonious, peaceful, you know, peace order good government kind of society, right? Um, and, and it's targeted to the arts and to culture and to education and, you know, it's, um, I think, a very, um, in that sense, a, a, a conservative in the sense of wanting to establish a kind of order. You know? But there's, a, there's, an order, there's an orderly society implied through all of this. And there's an order through nuance, perhaps. Yeah. Difference in yeah. Yeah. implied or not. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to formally thank Anne-Marie Nils, Marco, and Cohen for joining us this afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. Keep checking out on, on our website for future events and talks and films in our series through the end of this exhibition. So thank you for joining us. Uh, can I just say one more yes. thing that I forgot to say at the opening, which is that there is a catalog that, um, that Trevor mentioned, and they have it for sale downstairs. Oh, that's good.